Hello everyone. This is Toby from the Phuket Meditation Center and you're listening to the Dharana Meditation Podcast. Let's sit together, calm the busy mind and explore topics concerning character development, meditative training and deeper self-knowledge. Start by sitting upright, the head suspended from above, the body relaxed at ease. Take a couple of deep, comfortable breaths. Let your breath gradually slow down. Just give your body and your mind time to settle. Cultivating an attitude of non-resistance to whatever arises, accepting the various sensations, thoughts, states, moods that are passing through this moment. We're not trying to change anything or fix anything. Just leaving things as they are. And of course, as you sit here, all kinds of things will arise. Some are pleasant, some unpleasant. But the key is here to not interfere, not to do anything to any of those.
you know, to the extent that you reduce your level of doing, of trying, of being intentional, to that extent, you'll find that everything begins to settle down. Just like a glass that is filled with water and mud, if you steer it up and the water is murky, but if you just let it sit there on the table, all the dust particles in the water will settle by themselves. We can support this process a little bit as you breathe in, feeling the body. And while you're breathing out, let the physical tension, the muscular tension in your body dissolve a little bit, soften a little bit. And notice how each time your muscles get a bit more soft, more relaxed, feels a bit better. And all that matters is just this one breath. You can think of this breath as being one session of meditation. Feeling the body as you breathe in, releasing, softening as you breathe out.
Let that be your center point. Returning to the body as you breathe in and releasing as you breathe out. And from there, I'd like you to notice how your attention moves around naturally. Simply knowing where it is. When it goes to a sound, when it goes to a feeling, you know, when it goes towards the realm of thoughts, daydreaming. Simply knowing that. silent question we ask ourselves at this stage is what am I doing right now right this second where is my attention right now You might even notice how you're paying attention. What kind of states accompany your attention? Maybe there's some knee pain or some back pain. And as your attention goes there, it goes there with aversion, with anger, with frustration, with complaining. Again, we just observe that. There's nothing to change. You don't have to feel happy about your knee pain. This is not about altering. This is about knowing, observing. Waking up to the way things are.
And as you have settled down more and more into the present moment, then at some point, you can begin to place your attention solely on the breath. As you breathe in, knowing that you're breathing in. As you breathe out, knowing that you're breathing out. Again, just for the duration of one breath. There's no need to block out anything. You don't need to get rid of anything. Just let everything else gradually fade into the background as the focus increases on the breath. The breath comes into the foreground. Gently and consistently returning back to the breath, no matter what happens, just knowing the breath. And I know you will get a lot of visitors, a lot of distractions, many things happening that pull your attention away from the breath. This is normal. That's exactly the way it should be. It does not mean that you're making any mistake or that something is wrong with you. That is just the nature of the mind. When it moves, when it is deluded, when it is stimulated to the degree that we most of us at least are stimulated that's the outcome of that
So as soon as you notice that you're distracted, that's already great. And when you come back and you remember your breath, that's even better. And when you manage to stay with just one breath, great. That's exactly what we do over and over again. This gradually weakens the tendency of the mind to be all over the place. And in your own time, you can slowly come back, open your eyes gently, stretch the body a little bit. So, good morning, everyone. Nice to see all of you. So it's usually widely accepted that selfishness is a relatively bad thing. Some people have a mixed opinion on this. As some forms of selfishness are good, some are bad. And some consider it a really good thing as well. So there's different opinions on that. And so today I would like to reflect a little bit on this topic of selfishness because it's quite central to um, let's say, the spiritual path or spiritual endeavors, cultivation, and so on. I think we can say that all of us, without fail, would usually experience a sense of self, a sense of I, me. Language would be quite impossible without that too, right? You can't talk if you wouldn't use the words I, me, mine, when talking becomes impossible, even you exists in relation to me. You alone without a me doesn't make any sense. So the entire language and also our entire thought construct or our psychology is based on that little I, me, mine idea. And I think we can say it, it works, right? So it's not necessarily anything that is per se a problem. It's something that we need to use. It's practical. If I call you over there, I say, hey, Sandy, then you know I'm talking about you, right? So there is practical application of that self. 
However, it can get out of hand too. So there's extremes in, in everything really. It's the same goes for a sense of self. You can kind of blow it up like a balloon, right? You can make it very big. You can make your experience of I, me, mine very, very dominant. And as you do that, of course, then what is excluded gradually is the other. The I becomes more and more important and the other becomes less and less important because they are codependent. They need each other. Similarly, I can make the I, the self, very small, very tiny, but then the other becomes very important, very dominant. And that can be good in terms of walking on a spiritual path, and it can be detrimental. Example of when it is good it could be the reduction of the self due to a deeper understanding of what's beyond yourself. For example, a gradual shift over from identifying with this psychological <coughs> construct of me over to awareness. Just remaining consciousness, remaining here as consciousness rather than as Toby. Just being here as a knower, an observer, a witness, rather than a dramatic persona that has a past and a future hopes and fears and so on. So due to that shift over to awareness, to greater awareness, that little tiny psychological self becomes less important to you, I guess. Yes, You have a bit of a more... Hmm, uh, feeling of security within yourself. You, you don't need to do anything to your psychology anymore because it's much more peaceful and much more safe, much more grounded being here as awareness. So it's a fading away in a good way. Another example would be um, love passing through you. Just having an overwhelming experience of love, of compassion. Also, that makes the self smaller and makes the other more important. Uh, sometimes it happens uh, if you... if you are humiliated in front of a crowd and your own self becomes very, very small and if that crowd that you're humili humiliated in front of is very kind, is very accepting of you, genuinely, non-judgmental, then that can be replaced by a sincere appreciation of that self becoming smaller, of being received in love. It's like um, you put a, one of those as I call it, effervescent tablets, I think. You put them into water and they go shh and they just dissolve. So you're putting your little self into that water and it dissolves. And it can be a very pleasant experience. Albeit, it often is not humbling oneself, humiliation, um, the, making the self smaller is usually experienced as something like death and dying a loss of control, a loss of stability, a reliability, because we're so used to rely upon our uh, psychological construct of me that uh, when we let go of it or when it is made smaller, that feels terrifying. So we tend to avoid that. We tend to avoid situations where our self is made smaller and we tend to seek out situations where our psychological self is strengthened and made bigger. And we could really say that most of our activities are there to make our psychological self bigger. Make you feel more safe. Make you feel loved. Make you feel that uh, people pay attention to you and so on. All that makes you bigger. And that feels good. Winning the lottery, having a bunch of money all of a sudden, what does that do? Why does that feel so good? Because it makes the self a million times bigger. Now that self 
is not limited, doesn't perceive itself anymore as, as a limited self as it was before. Now it is a self with a million opportunities. That feels better, feels more safe, feels more flexible, and so on. Whereas the opposite, which is the case with the spiritual path, where you release the world, where you let go of, uh, of worldly affairs, that doesn't feel good. Yes, it feels kind of like being humbled, sometimes even like being crushed, being stripped, losing control, losing personal power over yourself. But it's in accordance with truth, really. What I always like to say is, are you the one that is beating your heart? Obviously not, right? You're not beating your heart. You're not consciously making an effort to pump that muscle. Similarly with digestion or other physical processes, your nervous system, keeping it intact, making sure that the nutrients of the food reach the right places all over your body. None of that is done by you. The vibration of the atoms that constitute your body, the way they exactly function, the DNA and all that kind of complex stuff, you're not doing any of it, right? You'd be overwhelmed by having to do it. Having the full responsibility of your own body, you would be dead within a second because you couldn't manage those millions of things that you would need to manage all at once, moment after moment. So the body runs autonomously. It runs without needing you to run it. The same goes for a more abstract principle such as life. We like to say it's my life. But if you analyze a little bit deeper, is life really something that can be owned? And if so, what would it be that owns life exactly? Is it apart from life? Is the owner different from what is owned? Or is the owner one with what is owned? If that was the case, if the owner is one with what is owned, the, the whole principle of ownership doesn't make any sense anymore. If you are what you own, then ownership is it's a ridiculous idea. So are you separate from the owner? Then are you separate from life, the owner of life, my life? My, it's a possessive pronoun that indicates possession, my life. I, that belongs to me. So are there, uh, is there a multitude of lives that is owned by a multitude of owners? Is that actually factual? Is that correct? Is that truthful? That there be a multitude of lives owned by a multitude of owners, which are all separate from that life. So the owner of life itself isn't life. It's bizarre, isn't it? And yet in language, we just use it like, no further questions asked. It doesn't even appear a tiny bit fishy to us at all. We just talk and think. And it seems to make perfect sense to us, my life. And it's now or never. <laughs> right? But it belongs to me, definitely. And don't you mess with my life. And then based upon this idea that I'm owner of my own life, and that this body also belongs to me, obviously, even though it does whatever it wants. It gets old, it gets ill. All, all things that happen to the body without me wanting it. So I'm kind of like a bit of a strange owner. If I'm not even doing the smallest, tiniest thing, down to the vibration of the atoms of my body, my so-called body, doing nothing of it. Even the concept that I can move it whenever I want to, I can lift my right arm whenever I want to. Well, thankfully, your nervous system allows for that. 
Thankfully, your surrounding allows for that so that you can have the illusion that it is you that moves that arm. And so you can claim something that isn't actually yours. So that is contemplating that little self as, as an owner of things, right? As a, another way that we like to perceive ourselves is a, as a controller of things. I'm the one that's in charge. And the greater the ego, the greater the sense of, of self is usually pushed up and blown up by control. So the more you feel that you have control over things, the more bigger the self becomes. The more the more the self is in an argument with God. Like the more control you have, the less important God becomes to you. Why would God still be important to you if you're the one running stuff? If you're the one that's so good at things? If you're the one, I've produced all my wealth. Why would I need God? I did all that. Since a lot of people have this concept of God like a kind of a father or mother figure, why would I need my parents if, if I can, I don't know, if I can flush my own toilet? I don't need to call mommy and daddy to help me, right? I only need to call mommy and daddy to help me if I don't know how to flush. So if you're in trouble, suddenly you become very spiritual. But when you're not in trouble, why need God? What for? There's nobody that I can talk to to give me stuff I want. Perhaps even just attention. I want to feel loved. And it's God's job to give me that feeling. But if you feel loved, you still need God? No. If you're very ill, you cry out for help. Please, God, help me, get me out of this. As soon as you heal up, quickly you forget. Right? So the bigger the self, the more of a competition arises between God and me. That's why in spiritual traditions, the humbling of the self is central. You enter a church. That big building is there to humble you. There is something bigger than yourself. There is something so much greater than you could ever be and standing in front of it, you are in awe. You become quiet. True humility makes the mind quiet. On the other side, uh, on the other side of that is true arrogance, which makes the mind very noisy because it is always right. It knows everything. On the side of humility, I know nothing. It's terrifying. I don't know anything, really. I'm just repeating stuff I've heard, actually. What do I know from myself? Just Google it, right? That's the thing people like to say. Oh, what? You don't know it? Just Google it. We equate knowledge with information intake. That's easy. You just need to learn stuff by heart and you're a very knowledgeable person, apparently. But really, you just know how to repeat. That's not knowledge. But for the self, for the little ego, it's a fantastic way to make itself big, isn't it? Tons of intellectual knowledge. I know all the texts. I know all the words. And I know all the rules of business. And I know all this and all that. That feels good. That's pleasant. And then you can watch conversations between adversaries, adversaries, I think, that, that are fighting with each other, political interviews and stuff. And then they fight with each other. It's a desperate battle for keeping myself big. And I go to great lengths, even, even looking extremely silly to those who watch. But at least I feel like I'm, I'm keeping the upper hand. Even what I say is just, you know, below any kind of reasonable standard. 
So we do everything to keep feeling me, to keep feeling big. Safe, loved, you name it. It's there to make yourself feel good. Spiritual path does the opposite. Remember that. It makes the self small. No, actually that's wrong. It doesn't make the self small. It reveals the self as small. Better. It simply reveals the fact that that self you think you are is just a bunch of constructs. It's a complex program that executes perfectly in relation to the surrounding and environment. It does exactly what it's programmed to do. Lucky you if you've received good programming in your life. Fantastic. Perhaps not, though. You've received some good programming, you get very successful, everything runs exactly your way. It keeps you from the divine. Because this illusion of me is strengthened through that. It's not weakened. So God gives us problems. And those problems can do a couple of things. They can make you humble, which hopefully they do. But very often the case is that once you've overcome your problem, it turns into arrogance again. I'm the one that solved it. Not kindness solved it. No, I want to claim it. I want to claim it. Reason solved it. Sounds a little bit worse than I solved it. To me, I solved it sounds better than reason solved it or kindness solved it. it. Means I want to claim it. If I claim it, I can feel big. If I feel big, I feel good. However, for today's talk, the idea is that there is such a thing as a right selfishness. Since we all have a self, and we're all dealing with a sense of self, you can't just switch over to enlightenment mode having no self. You can't just stop it. Just stop your ego thing. Don't have an ego. You can't. <laughs> you can't. And very often the case is that you might have had some beautiful experiences in your meditation. All of a sudden you think now you don't have a self. Now that's really dangerous. Because now the self makes itself big with the idea of not having a self. Like, yeah, but that's very common, actually. It's very common, that case, that you do a lot of spiritual practice and it makes you feel very good. Why does it make you feel so good? What do you think? Well, something is getting bigger. <laughs> and it's the wrong thing. If spiritual practice makes you feel good from the start, it's not it. It's a, it's a plaster. A comfort, a little thing, a little bomb that you put on and it makes you feel good. Painkiller. And while there is nothing wrong per se with painkillers and with getting out of painful situation, having beautiful experiences on the path, if those beautiful experiences are claimed by a self and used to make that self bigger, can turn into serious problems, especially when those experiences become very powerful. Hence, a lot of spiritual teacher would stress the importance of kindness and compassion prior to developing mental power. Because once you're off and you develop a lot of power, then that, that same ego that's been in charge is now empowered. That's a common theme, like the, the people who are disempowered if they all of a sudden receive power, it's not that they are really kind to those who have disempowered them. It's that they take revenge. And then they become those that they've hated previously. That's how it always works. Yeah. The poor working class folks, all of a sudden gaining power, stepping up, becoming the tyrannical oppressors of the masses. When the first reason why they stood up and became vocal was to protect the poor. Now they have the riches. They have the power. 
And it's not even conscious decision. It's not even like they wake up in the morning and go like, ha, huh, I want to suppress people like I've been suppressed today. It's just automatic, as I said. Conditioning. All runs neatly according to program. Not according to me, but according to program. So what is right type of selfishness then? It's that selfishness that you start off with that you know that by paying attention to yourself and getting to know yourself, you can gradually see the truth of yourself. By that, you can release what is untrue. And through that release, you experience a degree of peace. And that peace is what you share with the community. So right type of selfishness is that which is ultimately beneficial to the whole. It's not just beneficial to you. Wrong type of selfishness is always boosting up yourself and making others small. The right type of selfishness is seeing the truth of yourself and by that attaining release to varying degrees and through that release becoming beneficial in your community, your family, your household and so on. Now it's becoming increasingly hard to offend you to attack you, to make you feel your programmed feelings. Because what would it be that feels those feelings? Those feelings are now disowned. They're given back to the rightful owner. Call it Mother Nature. You're not claiming anything anymore that isn't actually yours. The claimant himself or herself doesn't exist. So what's there to be claimed? Why would I claim an emotion? Why? Why would I make it personal? Is it in fact personal? Is an emotion personal? Is there a feeling that comes up in your body that's turning against you, attacking you? Grief, depression, despair, frustration, anger, anxiety, annoyance. Is it coming up inside to attack you? Then what are you then? What is that which is attacked? It's because we do not understand the truth of these matters that we're totally deluded. We're daydreaming, day in, day out. We're dreaming up a sense of self that is attacked by the feeling that it itself produces. It's madness. We're turning around ourselves, day in, day out. Even at nighttime in our own dreams. In this madness, there is nothing but suffering. It's nothing but stress. It's just an endless array of change. But it doesn't offer you what you really seek, which is safety, which is happiness. And it's freedom from pain, freedom from suffering. It doesn't give you that. If you make something bigger, you will make other things smaller. If you make them bigger, you make yourself smaller. It's just endless. So right type of selfishness consists in, first of all, just getting to know what you do right now. What is it that I'm doing right now? Becoming aware of your choices and actions each and every moment and understanding the consequences of them. Thereby gradually deciding to abandon what is not good for you and cultivating what is good for you. That's the most basic form. Would you say a group is consisting of individuals, right? Yes? If you have a group of people, it consists of individuals. Would you also then say that the group is only as strong or as beneficial or powerful as each of those individuals that make it up? Obviously, right? So a group consists of individuals. Now, what if that group consists of individuals who are absolutely unaware of what they do, why they do it, how they choose to do it, who have zero self-awareness? Is that a group you want to belong to? And is that a group that will produce great results in this world? Obviously not. Bunch of loaded questions, I know. But it's, it's a fact that if a group consists of individuals that are 
having a greater degree of self-awareness, self-reflection, sincerity, honesty, that have a willingness to correct what is hurting the individual, then you will have a group consisting of 20,000 individuals who are not hurting themselves and who are instead uplifting themselves. So you get a great collective that creates benefit. Because each individual has created benefit for themselves by releasing what is not beneficial, by releasing what is not true. That's how you should tackle things. Not this idea that uh, we need to focus on groups, minorities, this, that. It's an abstract. It's like the government, quote-unquote. What does that even mean? It consists of people, right? And each and every individual in that machine that we call government makes decisions. And those decisions, they are based on what? Mood, rules and regulations, thoughts, climate, everything. Sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. But the government is an abstract you cannot deal with. You cannot deal with the government or the leftists or the right-wing people. You cannot deal with that. It's abstract. But I can deal with your opinion that you state to me. I can do something with that. I can think about that and I can discuss with you. I cannot discuss with a left-winger a right-winger. It's way too abstract. Like moving up in in a realm where an individual has lost all importance. No wonder people are so depressed these days. Because individuals have lost all importance. Everything is focused on groups of people. This group against that group and so on and so forth. While a group is a great way to boost your own feeling of importance, Belonging to a group. I am belonging to this group. I am a (laughs) supporter. So now, like, okay, now I can feel the the greatness of that group. We do this with superstars. Oh, I got a picture with Michael Jackson. He's he's signing my, my hat. And I got a picture of that. Why is that so desired? (gasps) He touched me. Why is that so amazing? Because it makes yourself so big in that moment. You get... You get to share in that massive self that's up there on that stage. You got to get a bit of a share of that, a feeling of being super boosted in that moment. Wow, my level of importance has risen to Michael Jackson touched me. That feels so good. That's just how we operate. It's how the self, as I said, we want to make ourselves bigger. Groups are a fantastic way to do this. Politicians are a great way to do this. Rock stars are a great way to do this. All serving to make the self bigger. Yet, so big like a balloon, but inside, totally empty. Nothing in there, just air. And we do not want that to be popped, because it would reveal that this air is just that the air that is around the balloon. <laughs> just the same stuff. I've lost all importance. I only kept it up with this facade of the, the rubber ball that I feel I am. But inside, totally empty. We're terrified of that emptiness. Hence, we're so fascinated with the illusion of the skin. But not what's beneath it. Yes? So using groups to make yourself big or something like that notice what it is that you are doing as an individual because each group is only as good as its individuals. It always starts there. How do you treat your own household inside of yourself? What about your own politics inside your own mind? Are they chaotic or are they balanced? Are they useful or not? Is what you're doing right now, this second, with your attention where you're placing it, or the intention, how you're directing it, useful or not. And then be brutally honest in answering it. And you will reveal a lot of things that humble you, but benefit you. 
that is the right kind of selfishness. Just in the starting, and I think we all should more or less do that if we want our lives to be a little bit better in terms of being more peaceful, more happy, more healthy. Take responsibility for yourself in a good way. That's the right type of selfishness. That's how we begin. And taking it from there, you're working your way up. It doesn't just stay at taking responsibility for yourself. Eventually, it goes to the transcendence of all that. But it got to start with something. And the right type of responsibility is that which orients you towards liberation, release, enlightenment, ascension, however you want to call it. The wrong type of responsibility is that responsibility which leads to a bigger self. I did that. I flushed the toilet. You know, that type of thing, it's not going to help you in the long run. Might help you in short term, but in the end, it's useless. Just another thing. Just another atom bouncing around. Okay? So that's all that comes to mind for today. Yeah, I think we can stop here today, yes. Thank you very much for coming. We hope you enjoyed this episode and had a meaningful time. For more information and upcoming events, head over to our website at phuket-meditation.com Thank you very much for listening and have a wonderful day.